welcome to a new podcast episode of Radiology AI. My name is Dania Day, and I'm the Associate Editor for Social Media for Radiology AI. And today, my co-host, Polly, and I are very excited to bring a new episode of the podcast series. Today, we will be interviewing Dr. Bradley Erickson, a pioneer in imaging informatics for decades. Dr. Erickson, we are very excited to have you with us today. First, I will uh, start with a brief introduction for Dr. Erickson. Dr. Erickson is a professor of radiology at Mayo Clinic Rochester, where he was previously associate chair for research from 2013 to 2020. He most recently became medical director for AI for the Mayo Clinic Enterprise. Dr. Erickson received his undergraduate degrees in biology and chemistry from Concordia College, followed by an MD and PhD from the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Mayo Graduate School. Subsequently, he completed residency and fellowship in neuroradiology at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Erickson is an international research and thought leader in AI and radiology and is a fellow of the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, SIM. He directs the Radiology Informatics Lab and his research interests include computer-aided diagnosis and the use of computer technologies to extract information from medical images for diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic purposes as well as combining imaging data with other modalities, including genomics and pathology. He is also the chief medical officer at Flow Sigma, a company that provides solutions for the efficient and reliable execution of image-based analytics. Dr. Erickson, thank you for joining us today. I will turn it over to my co-host, Paul, for the interview. So Dr. Erickson, thanks again for joining us on the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. We're really excited to have you here and hear about your experiences and wisdom over the years. And so you've been a pioneer in imaging informatics for decades, having led the transition into filmless radiology at Mayo Clinic and subsequently into other technological paradigm shifts, including AI. Can you tell us about your background and what got you into imaging informatics in general and more recently into AI and machine learning? Sure. So not to go too far back, but I, I grew up in a rural area in northern Minnesota on, on a hobby farm. And I think that from the start, particularly my dad influenced me about the importance of being able to figure out how things worked and to fix them when they broke, because we didn't have things like Amazon at the time. We had to either get it working ourselves or do without. And and so I think from the early times, I had a lot of curiosity. And, and I remember when I was maybe 10, 12 years old, my dad said, OK, here's the lawnmower engine, take it apart, put it back together again, and then mow the lawn when you're done. And you know, I think that that, again, when you know the pressure is on understanding how things work is, is a critical thing. Another influence is a neighbor of mine was an electrical engineer he, who had retired. Um, and back at that time, there were these things called Heath kits. I don't know that they exist anymore, but basically you would be sent a box full of parts and an instruction manual and you would be, uh, and you would put it together. And he had a number of those and he said, well, let's try to figure out some other ways that we can work with these kits. And so we would try to uh, riff on, on the basic designs that they had. And so again, that was a good experience in understanding how things work. Um, as I moved into college age, um, I, I did a lot of um, work in chemistry, automating instruments using microcontrollers, the 6502 processor. And so we wrote the complete operating system as well as the IO system, a disk operating system that actually we, we uh, measured the timing between pulses and, and would control the pulses to record the information. And, um, that was a great learning experience as well. Um, so, you know, that then kind of led to more technical expertise. And so I got into a lab where we were designing um, 3D image analysis software for a device here called the Dynamic Spatial Reconstructor. Essentially, it was 14 fluoroscopes on a gantry. And so it could do 60 complete volumes every second. So true volumetric imaging in real time. But, you know, this was in the 80s. And so at that time, you know, processors were much weaker. And so we had to write our own software to analyze all that volumetric data. And so that's where I got into image processing. And at that time, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning techniques were pretty weak. 
Um, I did a little bit of work with support vector machines and neural networks as part of my PhD thesis, but it basically didn't work very well, which is why AI really wasn't very popular back then. So, you know, that that's kind of the, the background of I've always had a technology bent. I've loved to learn how things work and try to figure out how to improve on them. And, and uh, that has been both a pleasure and, and it has served me pretty well. I think that's super interesting because it sounds like there's always been this common thread throughout your life of curiosity and uh, being involved with technology. Um, I'm curious though, since you worked with neural networks and even support vector machines back in the 80s, long before most radiologists had even heard of that, did you ever imagine that neural networks would take off, you know, some 20, 30 years later the way that they have? I think there was the expectation that there was that possibility, but it was clear that something had to happen in order to make it work. And, and you know, if I was to lay money at the time, I would have bet more on support vector machines. Um, artificial neural networks were just so fragile back then that they seemed like an interesting academic pursuit, but not something that would have any practical value. Yeah, I can totally I was see wrong. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's pretty interesting that um, I suppose the video game industry really helped shepherd in this new era. Yeah. yeah. So for the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about integrating AI into radiology departments. But recently, I've seen efforts to integrate different clinical departments towards a more global approach towards clinical development, validation, and deployment of AI. And one example is your new role as medical director for AI at the Mayo Clinic, which I understand to be a role working with other physicians and leaders across the healthcare system. So as we're thinking about different paradigm shifts, um, you know, with the new AI era, and I think more specifically in medicine, can you talk about this new role and what kind of paradigm shift this may be signaling for the clinical integration of AI? Yeah, so the role allows me to have a much more global view and particularly to push the potential of AI into the practice, not just in radiology, but everywhere else. I think that it's important to recognize that AI always does better anytime it has more information. And I'm somewhat disappointed or you know, expect much greater things once we start to build AI tools in radiology that go beyond the pixels. Right. The, the, the reason that Jeff Hinton made his um, misprediction about replacing radiologists is because he thought all the information was there in the pixels. And of course, we all know that reading an, an image without an indication, without any history is really, really hard. And the same is true for AI, right? How can we expect AI to do well if we only give it the pixels? And I'm convinced that AI is going to do much, much better once we figure out good ways to get all the non-pixel information into those systems as well. So that means we need to work more with our non-imaging or, or you know, non-pixel colleagues. Um, and that means getting more of that additional information out of the, the EMR. So I'm a neuroradiologist, and when I look at an MR of the head, when you see a bunch of lesions and it's a 30 year old female, that makes me think of one thing as opposed to if it's a 70 year old male with hypertension, you know, that kind of makes those spots look like a different disease process. And so that's where we have to be realistic in our expectations of AI and also understand the importance of all that non clinical information. The other piece that I think was a bit of a surprise when I came into this role is I thought I would be helping the departments with the technical aspects. And as we got into it really pretty early on, we recognized that a much bigger challenge was the data and regulatory components. Data is critical to doing AI well and not understanding where the data come from and in particular how it was annotated or curated can be another subtle source of bias. We, you know, we hear all about bias and the populations that come in, but you can have a great population, but if your annotation process or the way that you select diagnoses or predict diagnoses has a bias in it, well, then you're just as bad off, right? So, so it's critical that we understand the whole chain, not just the source of data. Another piece is that if you want to use this, 
regulatory agencies like the FDA become a major component. And, and certainly if you're commercializing it, you need FDA clearance, but even if you're using it in the practice for certain types of applications, some would argue that you need FDA clearance. And that means that you've got to then implement a lot of the infrastructure to do the steps that are required for FDA clearance. So that means, again, looking at where did our data come from, who did what annotation, you know, who fussed with you know, this one and changed the answer because of X, Y, or Z. That may be totally legitimate, but you better have it documented. And anytime that there's a problem with the AI or you know, how do you track the results and performance of the AI system are all critical components of really complying and, and uh, you know, appropriately managing an, an AI tool. And so that piece of it was something that I didn't go into it expecting would be, you know, the major step, but, you know, at least for the first few months now in this role, that's really become the main thing that we work, work on. And the technology piece is actually perhaps third or fourth. That's really interesting because it reminds me of a lot of issues that have come up within even the radiology world. If we're going a little bit more granular that, I think a lot of people in research um, didn't anticipate. Uh, one key example, I think, is the pneumothorax detection problem, where people are like, oh, wow, we have an AUC 0.9 or above. But when we actually look under the hood, there's a lot of chest tubes that are being identified as opposed to the pneumothorax itself. And I think that what that signals to me is that anytime we introduce a new technology that's going to interface with healthcare or any type of uh, subject matter, there's a need to educate from the different point of views. In this case, it may be clinicians with the engineers um, and vice versa with engineers kind of educating about the limitations of techniques. Even when we talk about things like saliency maps or class activation maps, which help us see that chest tubes are being picked up, that's been shown in um, a few recent works that they're not always reliable for actually depicting medical abnormalities. So in light of that, it sounds like um, a lot of your role has actually been functionally educating people about all of the different parts of this pipeline, whether it's image data curation, both in the technical aspects, but maybe more recently in the practical potential pitfalls. So I'm curious, do you have any suggestions for people who are desiring or need to have training about AI, maybe in the clinical aspects or technical, or maybe somewhere in between? Because it seems like a lot of the unforeseen Obstacles are sort of the translational components. So we'd love to hear anything you have to offer on that. Yeah, there, there are many um, levels to that question. You know, the, the first thing I would say is I really hate the term artificial intelligence. It's neither artificial nor is it intelligent. But because we use that term, people expect that it should behave in an intelligent fashion. So the example you gave of pneumothorax, well, we know, of course, that the chest tube is a treatment for it but the AI doesn't, right? And so that's, that's a problem of, of understanding or expecting what it can and can't do. Um, I think also the explainability piece, you, you mentioned things like saliency maps and class activation maps. The problem with those is that for some things, we know where it is. So for instance, I've worked on glioma genomic prediction, right? Well, the saliency map will light up the tumor but does that tell me why it predicted its IDH mutant? No, right? So, so that's a problem is that if it's simply a detector, then yes, saliency maps can help. But if it's a classifier of why it's one disease or another, the saliency map may not be quite so important. And the problem is, what else do we have? And you know, to, today, we don't really have anything um, you know, it probably is some sort of texture, but our descriptors for textures are really poor, right? Things like brown glass opacities and, and such, you know, computers want numbers and, uh, you know, a miliary pattern or a ground glass opacity is not a, a number. And so until we come up with a better nomenclature for textures, I think we're going to struggle with those texture-based differentiators that, that an AI can find. Now to get to the, the latter part of your question about, you know, what can people do about this? You know, one of the wonderful things about the time we live in now is that there are resources out on YouTube and, and other places that have tremendous educational value for learning about AI 
and how it works. And so one of the first places that I would encourage people to do is to go out to YouTube and, and do a search AI tutorial or, you know, radiology AI tutorial, and you'll be amazed how much is out there. And so I teach a course in AI here at the grad school, and I've actually gone to a reverse schoolroom approach. So basically I give a list of videos that are YouTube videos or something like that. And then the classroom is really more discussion about them. And, and most of them are not radiology specific or imaging specific. So that's really the content of the classroom time. But the animations that people have done, there's no way that I have time, let alone the skills to produce those. So the educational value of what's out there in the public domain is tremendous. For those who want to move beyond that, um, an increasing number of institutions, including mine now, are starting to create things like masters in AI, where you do a year of evening courses or something like that, and, and you'll get a master's degree. You know, again, I don't know that people need a piece of paper to hang on the wall, but hopefully it will have the value of on helping you understand how AI works and more importantly, how it fails. And so I think there, there are a lot of resources like that, but, but I would say, you know, start with YouTube because that has an amazing amount of really good quality information. Thank you for the suggestions. I've also found YouTube to be good, but uh, one thing that I think is a little bit challenging is some of the material, it may not necessarily be geared towards people who are more from the clinical mindset, or even from our um, imaging informatics colleagues. I've had some conversations with some of the folks here at Hopkins where I'm finishing up my fellowship, where they want to learn more about it, but then they get into the weeds in these videos. They're talking about linear algebra and a lot of math, and they're just like, listen, I need to know how to best serve the radiology department in this era. And so um, I'm curious if you have any suggestions for people who are finding themselves facing that challenge, where some of the material may be a little bit beyond the scope of what they're trying to do and maybe more from a clinical standpoint? Find another one. I mean, that you're right. There are some of them that are extremely mathematical, but there are a number that do it completely visually. And so I think if a video stops resonating with you or you find that you're lost, go back to your search results and find another one. Uh, you know, again, I, I there are probably more than 100 videos out there that would hit that space. And all of them have a different angle or different take on it. And I know that there are a number that are non-mathematical in their presentation. So I, I would say just, you know, don't, don't be afraid to stop watching a video and go back and try to find another one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, shifting gears a little bit towards your uh, practical experiences at Mayo, as AI has started to move out of the lab and into the clinic, many radiology departments may not know the best way to get their practices, uh, quote unquote, AI ready. Can you share some thoughts and advice for departments considering how to best prepare themselves to be ready for integrating AI into their practices, maybe both in personnel as well as some of the material or infrastructure considerations? So one concern I have is that, again, because we use the term intelligence in the title for this, People think that these tools will do the right thing and they will do exactly the narrow task that they're taught to do. And I think that that's important to recognize is that every tool that I'm aware of in radiology is narrow task. And by that, I mean, you can have a pulmonary nodule finder, okay, that will not find pulmonary emboli, that will not find liver metastases, that will not find lesions in the bones, right? It does a very narrow task. And what that means then is that the idea that it will replace a radiologist is, is first of all absurd, but it means that if we want very many things done by AI, we're going to have to figure out how to orchestrate them, how to get all the right images to the right tools, and perhaps more importantly, how to get those results back to the radiologist in a consumable form. And so that's where a dumber form of AI probably is more relevant. You know, the, the original AI application in medicine was a program called Mycin. 
And Mycin was uh, created by Ted Shortliff, who was a grad student back then and at Stanford. And it was a system of around 500 rules that basically would figure out what the likely agent was for a infection and also what antibiotics should be used. So, you know, it was very nice in the sense that it was very understandable and you could have a logical process that it would work through. That sort of technology now is used widely in other industries like manufacturing, um, and it's called either robotic process automation or intelligent process automation. And there are descriptor languages for what a business process is, you know, when you're manufacturing a car, for instance. And I think that that sort of technology probably is going to be a critical element of success for AI. And that's because it has the sophistication to pull together to understand, oh, this image plus this blood test result needs to go to this AI tool, this image, and you know this um, pathology specimen result needs to go here, right? And, and at least as importantly, the, these sorts of technologies have been tried in healthcare before and generally have failed and the reason for failure is that they didn't model all of the exception situations. And of course, medicine is replete with, with exceptions, right? Patients have unexpected things, you know, they fall down while they're in the hospital and develop other problems, or, you know, they just don't behave the, the way we tell them, or the, the doctor doesn't behave the way that we tell the doctor to behave, right? And so the ability to address exceptional situations you know the image acquisition wasn't quite right because the patient weighed 400 pounds and had you know a different a noise profile all those exception situations will be a problem for implementing ai if you don't consider how you're going to handle them you know if a human has to deal with all of those exceptions they're going to throw up their hands and say let's go back to doing it the old way so you need to be thinking about how you're going to integrate them all together, how you're going to orchestrate it, and in particular, what your whole workflow process is, in, and in particular, paying attention to those exception situations. I, I think that's really insightful about the uh, exceptions, because one thing that I've experienced, um, even doing some of this uh, research myself, is that uh, maybe not even in exceptions, the norm seems to be a lot of inconsistency in things like labeling images. For instance, I was doing a project trying to identify stroke, and one thing we found was that a CTA study would be labeled under nine different names within the imaging enterprise. And within there, the series of interests, namely the thin, raw uh, acquisition images, those had over 20 different names. I had a conversation with a friend and mentor at a very large imaging uh, enterprise. And he was telling me that they're trying to integrate some AI for uh, knee osteoarthritis detection or knee pathology. And probably one of the simplest studies, a PA flexion knee, over 124 different names. So when you talk about shuttling images and the appropriate types of images to the appropriate type of model or evaluation tool, I think that even beyond exceptions, the norm is such that that'll be really difficult. And so one thing that that signals to me is that there's going to be a need to really have somebody or some group of people who are ensuring quality and safety of these models that they're actually being deployed in the way that they're meant to. And so one proposition that's been made is that each radiology department will need an AI director, analogous to a quality director or a medical physicist within a department to make sure that these systems are actually running the way they should. So for departments considering this potential role or some type of analogous role, do you have advice on how to think about this, to prepare for this role, to consider potential candidates for this role, and more down the line, how to actually monitor this task of quality and safety evaluation? I, I think that that's an important point, and, and particularly in the early days of AI, that's going to be important. I suspect that over time, these challenges will be increasingly recognized and handled appropriately from the start. But, you know, for those who remember back to the early days of CT and MR, there were similar sorts of thoughts. And, and in fact, many departments at the time had people who were essentially MRologists, right? 
uh, that you would split the expertise by modality, not body part. I don't know that too many places have an arrangement where people only read MRs, but every type of MR, but instead they tend to be, you know, neuroradiologists or, or abdominal radiologists or something like that. And I think the similar situation will occur here that at the start, there will be people who are very current with the AI literature and in particular understand all the ways that we can be fooled by AI techniques and will be, you know, riding herd on, on all the AI tools being brought in to make sure that they're handled appropriately. Over time, people will figure out those patterns and that role probably will disappear. But I think at the start now, that, that's a critical capability that every department needs to have. Definitely. Um, so we've seen a lot of exciting work in the AI performed by academic research groups, like the Radiology Informatics Lab that you direct at Mayo, as well as commercial products by various companies and startups. And while commercial products are certainly available for purchase, another route is to integrate so-called homegrown algorithms into the PACs, uh, which you and Felipe Kitamura recently wrote a technical how-to article in the Magician's Corner section of the Radiology AI Journal. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on integrating homegrown algorithms versus commercial products? And are there certain pros or cons that you think should be considered when evaluating these different approaches? So in terms of the technology to do it, I think it's critical, again, to map out the workflow and to understand, you know, how are these tools going to be used? From that perspective, it's not so important whether it's homegrown or commercial, right? You, you just need to make sure that it's handled right. At our institution, we do have a mixture of both commercial and, and homegrown applications that have been put into the practice. At present, they're kind of in different categories. The, the commercial applications are work list prioritization type tools. The homegrown tools are more quantitative in nature. So they do things like measure body composition, measure kidney volume, measure liver volume. And so the, the workflow for them is fairly different. In the, in the case of the homegrown tools, then we produce images that show the segmentation as well as then we feed the, the uh, numerical information uh, into the reporting system. And so I think it's critical that you have workflows, you know, if there was a commercial tool that also did some, say, brain quantitation, uh, uh, it should have a similar look. And, and in fact, there is a non-AI tool that does uh, brain quantitation for dementia, and it has the same workflow as our AI tool. And so I think that sort of consistency is important for acceptance by the radiologist. Perhaps a more subtle thing, and when we wrote that article, um, there was concern about FDA. The FDA issue is an important one to think about. Um, if you're doing homegrown, there are ways that you can use an, a homegrown application without getting FDA clearance and, and, you know, essentially I'll just say, talk to your lawyer about that because it's not a simple uh, answer to figure out how that can be done appropriately. I think it's critical that you have ways to make sure that the AI is doing the right thing, right? So workless prioritization, that's not such a big deal. If you're making a diagnosis, then you better have a way to check up on what's going on or, you know, the uh, Ronald Reagan's trust but verify. Um, you know, if, if you have pretty good data, enough data that you put it into the practice, then, yeah, you know, you should be able to report it out. Many radiology reports don't have certain diagnosis, right? We often list the top three. And amazingly enough, sometimes the correct diagnosis is not in the top three, and yet that's considered acceptable. The same, I think, can be true of AI. We can't expect it to be any more perfect than humans, but we also need to track it, just like how we do peer review on humans. We need to do that tracking on AI and make sure that it is performing up to the level that we expect it. And then also, again, you can then start to document what the level of performance for that tool is. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it sounds like there's been a lot of uh, 
practical experience in integrating these uh, algorithms, whether it's homegrown or commercial. And so I'm sure that many, if not most radiologists, uh, myself included, have not actually experienced using AI clinically and are probably curious about potential pitfalls to avoid uh, when starting to use this. So I'm curious, do you have any tips or lessons learned from this initial work, maybe on the practical side, putting on your radiologist hat, maybe at the workstation? You know, these are things that, you know, maybe we didn't foresee or things that, you know, we wish we had known. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, potential hiccups there. So I'm curious if you have anything to share for our listeners. Yeah, there, there are things that are unforeseen. And, and one thing that we do when we implement tools into the practice is that we first do uh, what we call a simulation lab, where we go into a you know non-live clinical environment and test the tools and see if things really work the way we expect them to. And there are always glitches or nuances about how the tool conveys information that maybe were not expected Maybe it was expected by the engineer who built it, but not expected by the practicing radiologist, right? So how you express numbers, those sorts of things are sometimes a little bit different between clini clinical radiologists and, and the uh, systems engineer. So trying it in a non-patient care environment, I think, is the first thing that that is important to do. I think also trying to model the workflow and trying to ensure as much consistency across tools is critical. With the fact that AI is so narrow, it's really unlikely that one tool is going to do everything about a, you know, a, a, an abdominal CT, for instance, right? You will have to get multiple tools and get the outputs of multiple tools somehow integrated. And figuring out how that integration can be done in a way that is optimal for the practice of radiology is a challenge. And so understanding, you know, how the output of a given tool is represented is critical. If, for instance, one tool creates an image and burns the text into the pixels of the image and says, that's how our results come, and the next one does it as a DICOM SR, and you know the next one does it as a, as an XML file. That's not going to be pretty for the radiologist. It's going to be rather ugly for the systems engineer. But you know that that's the sort of thing you need to think about: is how do we want our architecture to be done in a way that will make it easy for us to get the best of breed of all these different AI tools, so that we can have a number of them to to help solve the important problems. But at the same time not have it feel like it is the Saturday hash, you know, that the radiologist has to integrate in their head. You know, we're, we're having to do too much of that already. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure it's going to be uh, helpful for those who are considering actually using AI clinically. As we move into the last few minutes of our time together, I want to ask you a question that we ask all of our guests. Uh, what are you most excited about for the next decade in radiology, AI, or informatics? So I think there are a few things that that I think are going to really change radiology for the better. Um, one is I've been impressed with how much information is present in images that we humans don't currently perceive. Now, maybe we will eventually perceive it. Maybe we will learn from the AI what the texture is that predicts, you know, IDH mutation or MGMT methylation, for instance. And I think that that will be an advance both in the way we practice medicine, but also in our understanding, right? Why, why does that texture look that way on a T2 image? And, and that may lead to insights that can further improve the way we take care of patients. And, and so I think that that's going to actually drive an increase in, in demand for imaging. I think quantitation, you know, we just say, well, that liver looks like about the right size. Well, you know, if we start to measure the liver volume and then maybe correct it for lean body mass, which can also be measured, um, we may start to find subtle diagnoses or risk predictors that we simply can't do today. So I think that that's going to be an important thing. I think AI can also help with incidental findings. It's just kind of human nature that when we see a big finding, we're kind of patting ourselves on the back about how I you know, figured out that it was a such and such disease and, you know, all the associated things. And 
oh, by the way, the patient does also have this other thing, but because we got distracted, that's the common problem, right? It's the edge of the film problem that, that we always think about and hear about in radiology and and we try to make sure it doesn't happen, but you know the fact is it still does. We still see cases coming in where, uh, you know, again in neuroradiology, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis is missed, or you know a disc space infection, you know, because the end plates of the vertebral bodies are starting to lose the appropriate density. That's something that in, it's a narrow task, but an AI can learn to do that reliably and and. You know, if we're distracted by other things, but the AI can remind us, hey, you know, don't forget to look at this or, you know, this looks suspicious. Um, I think that that's another good value for, for both us radiologists and for patients. I think it can also help to pull a lot of the more buried information that we get today in the EMRs, you know, something like where the EMRs can talk together and pull all the records together from all the different hospitals that a patient has been seen at is wonderful unless you have to actually use it, right? Now you have to go in, out there and look at it. But again, particularly for us in radiology, we probably can have an AI that will go out and find most of the important things very reliably, at least as reliably as a human can. And it can do it automatically and have everything teed up for us. And, and so it it is a way for um, us to get the filtered, refined, um, high quality information about a patient that we need. So I think there are a number of ways that AI is going to improve the, the practice of medicine and, and radiology in particular. All right, well, I'm excited for that future. So Dr. Erickson, thank you again for joining us here on the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Uh, it's been great to hear about your background, your experiences, and your insights and predictions for the future. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk with you. All right. And then we'll give it back to Danya. Thank you, Dr. Erickson, for a great discussion. And thank you for sharing with us your journey, your perspective on AI, and your outlook for the future of the field. I am sure many of our listeners will benefit from hearing this conversation. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in to this podcast episode. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our Radiology AI podcast series on any of iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Please stay tuned for our next episode.